Merlin Tuttle is an internationally recognized leader in research, conservation, and photography of bats, and is widely known as the father of modern bat conservation. His photography has been featured in five articles in National Geographic and in countless other publications, providing a firm foundation for conservation efforts worldwide. Since 2014, he has lectured at leading institutions of science from Bulgaria, Cambodia, Taiwan, Thailand, Brazil, Chile, and Costa Rica to South Africa. His global experience spans more than 60 years. He founded and led Bat Conservation International for nearly 30 years, retiring in 2009, then founded Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation in 2014 due to unprecedented new threats to bats that require his unique expertise. His most recent books, The Secret Lives of Bats, My Adventures with the World's Most Misunderstood Mammals, and the Smithsonian's book titled Bats, an Illustrated Guide to All Species, have received top reviews. And if you haven't seen those yet, please just check them out. They're really, really cool. He also serves as a research fellow in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Texas at Austin and takes more than 1,000 new photos annually. To learn more about bats or support his work, visit MerlinTuttle.org. So with that, Dr. Tuttle, please come. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I don't know if I deserve quite all those accolades, but uh, I'll take them. <laughs> I am especially pleased to speak to you who have created another seemingly impossible, uh, reached a, another seemingly impossible challenge in creating the art of the Appalachia. Uh, I remember hearing last night about how Everybody thought that your goals of saving old growth habitat were impossible. Well, let me assure you, when I resigned a full-time research position to study bats, I was in the same boat with you. Everybody thought I had to be stark raving mad, if not insane, <laughs> to be doing such a thing. Uh, the world of bats, however, is absolutely chuck full of amazing surprises. And in fact, it's not nearly so difficult to win friends for bats as one might think. It's just a matter of bringing them out of the dark and having people see and understand them. Full of surprises. How many of you would have thought you'd ever see a bat as pretty as any butterfly? Or a yellow-winged bat from Central Africa? Or a Snow White? ghost bat from Latin America. Bats can be just as cute and winsome as any panda. They can be as strange as any dinosaur. <laughs> there are more than a few dinosaur-like bats. When speaking to children, I always ask them, you know, it's, it's interesting how easy it is to change perceptions. If you just show them suddenly a picture like this, they'll say, oh, gross. <laughs> but if you ask them first how much they like dinosaurs, oh, yeah, they like dinosaurs. Well, we've got bats that are just as strange as any dinosaur, but they must be a little smarter than dinosaurs because they're still alive. <laughs> and we do have jolly good fellows. <laughs> now... I've often been told that people might like bats a whole lot better if, it weren't, if bats weren't so ugly. I'll let you be the judges of this. These are the four most widespread bats in America. All four of them may in fact right now be in this area. <clears throat> and there's much we'd like to learn from bats. For example, even the smallest bats have been known to live up to 40 years in the wild. That's the equivalent of a human living, a human, a hundred year old human being able to still run sprints through obstacle courses. Why is it that bats almost never get arthritis or cancer? In bats like these, 
actually have been discovered to have social systems strikingly similar to higher primates. They recognize each other, form long-term friendships, help each other in need, even adopt orphans. This is a bat that you have seen if you've been in caves in this area. The tricolored bat has declined alarmingly in this area because of the fungus that causes white nose syndrome being added on top of the fact that we chased them out of their original caves that they needed. This bat, the big brown bat, is not nearly as vulnerable because it can survive very low temperatures. Those of you who went out on the bat walk or the night walk last night heard one of these. Erin had a bat detector and almost the moment she turned it on, we heard one of these bats within 40 feet of us feeding. Most of us are just not aware of how closely involved with bats are we are on a routine basis. I mean, how is it that we could just not even have started our walk last night, turn on a bat detector, and right there we hear feeding big brown bats. Well, the interesting thing about these guys is that they can survive sub-freezing body temperatures. If you catch one in the summertime and put it in very cold temperature, it will die. But if you catch it in late fall and do the same thing, it will survive. It apparently is producing something the equivalent of antifreeze in its circulatory system in the fall for winter. And I have actually found one of these that was frozen into ice with just its head sticking out and I chipped the ice away and the bat wakened up and flew off. Bats come from giants with, you know, giant flying foxes with almost six foot wingspans to tiny bumblebee bats that weigh less than a U.S. penny. They're incredibly sophisticated. This California leaf-nosed bat can survive for months at a time in America's hottest, driest deserts without drinking a drop of water. And it has hearing so sensitive that it can hear the faintest footsteps of a walking cricket. Pallid bats are immune even to the deadliest stings of scorpions and centipedes upon which they feed. Fishing bats can detect objects as fine as a human hair and just two millimeters long on the surface of a pond of water. Frog-eating bats are incredibly intelligent. You can teach them in just a matter of minutes a new call that they've never heard before. They, they identify all the frogs in a jungle where they live by their calls, and that way they avoid trying to capture a poisonous one that could kill them. In fact, I'll go back and tell you one story. These bats are all so intelligent, it's incredible. Uh, Fred here had been in captivity for 13 years when I took this picture. This picture is taken on a tabletop pond in Rod Souther's lab in Indiana. And uh, this bat had long since been trained to come when he saw a white flag go up. That was his signal that it was okay to come fish in this tabletop pond. So when I took Dieter Plaga there, to, he's one of the top, probably foremost wildlife cinematographers who ever lived. We went there to film one of these guys catching a fish, and we needed to have some sequences where he was just hunting and not catching anything. Rod warned us that if we tricked him, called him down to feed more than four times in a row without letting him get something, he would get mad and come and splash water on the camera. <laughs> Dieter didn't believe it, you know, he just couldn't believe that an animal like that would have that kind of thought powers and memory. And so when he got done getting his film, he wanted to try this. So four times we call this bat down. He comes down, he doesn't get anything. Okay. Fifth time I tell Dieter, you know, maybe you better put some plastic over that half million dollar camera of yours. 
Uh, he put plastic over the camera. We called the bat, didn't give him anything, and the bat got mad and came over and splashed water on the camera. <laughs> These frog-eating bats, we have shown that we can train them to come on call to your hand, or we can train them to come to a novel, like a ringtone on a phone. We can mark them and release them back to the wild, and years later, they can be recaptured and still remember to come on call to your hand or to respond to the ringtone on a phone. Bats live in a wide variety of places. That doesn't mean that any bat can live in any kind of place. They're specially adapted for the specific places they live. These are disc winged bats. See, they have a little adhesive disc on each wrist and on their uh, ankles, and they could crawl right up a slick window pane with those. They live in unfurling leaves. And the bamboo bat has a specially flattened skull so that it can go in and out of tiny beetle holes in bamboo with amazing rapidity. This is a woolly bat coming out of a pitcher plant. Now, we all know, presumably, that pitcher plants are famous for eating whatever goes in. Even, they'll even eat rats. But there is a pitcher plant species in Borneo that actually has co-evolved with woolly bats, and it produces an umbrella to keep the bat dry. It has a special ledge down below where the bat can hang like in a bunk bed. This is a reflective area that reflects the bat's echolocation as it approaches and guides him in like airport landing lights guide a pilot at night when landing on a runway. This little bat, there's a cool story behind him. You can't photograph these really in the wild because where they lived, there's waist deep water. It rained unpredictably about every hour or so. Uh, there were poisonous pit viper snakes hanging from the vines. There were every kind of problem you could think of that would make you not want to photograph them in the wild. So Paula and I put together a set in my collapsible studio, and we're going to photograph this bat going in and out of his natural roost in that set. But the first night, I had to hand feed it mealworms to make sure it would be okay. The next morning, Paul and I came back to start building a set, and the bat immediately, he didn't go to Paula, who didn't feed him the night before. He came directly to me and start bumping me in the face. <laughs> and if you have any doubts about this story, I wouldn't tell it except that I've got a video on our website that Paula took showing the bat bumping me in the face. And then when I got a mealworm and held it out for it, it immediately turned around and flew out and took the mealworm out of my fingers. I mean, I could not believe. Here's a four gram bat. That's a it weighs less than a nickel trying to train me <laughs> that when he bumped me in the face, I should give him a mealworm. There's some pretty amazing stories behind some of these pictures, as you can tell. Now, I was told today about bats camouflage. You ever see anything more camouflage than those little dudes? Until you're right up on them, they look like moss or lichen. These are proboscis bats. These are uh, Honduran tent making bats. If you've been to Costa Rica, you may have seen them. They're a frequently viewed bat on nature trails there. They look green like the leaf, but they're snow white. They're green only because I haven't shined the light on them and the light 
sunlight's coming through the leaf and turning them green. This is a male in his harem. And speaking of getting together, some of the courtship displays of bats are truly remarkable, among the most amazing in the world of mammals. This epaulated bat has cheek pouches that he can inflate. In fact, the one I showed you earlier, they called the jolly good fellow. You were seeing his cheek pouches inflated with food. They can use those pouches either for food like a chipmunk or to create resonance in their so singing like a frog. In addition, he has pouches in his shoulders where he hides snow white epaulets and you can't see those epaulets except when he's decided to court. And then he flashes those and does a wing dance while he sings to attract a mate. And I could always tell when a mate was approaching because he would be going along, conk, conk, conk. And then when the female would start approaching, it was like a Geiger counter. You'd go, conk, 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 conk. <laughs> and whoever saw a bat like this? <laughs> this is a crested freetail bat. The male spreads that big fancy crest, just like a peacock spreads his tail when he goes courting. Now, you, by now you've seen enough to know that bats are an incredibly diverse group of animals. There are more than 1,400 species known. And they're incredibly sophisticated and fascinating. But there's a lot more reason than just that why we should study bats. When I first founded an organization solely for the study of bats, and announced my resignation from a full-time professional tenured research position. As I said earlier, everybody thought I was absolutely crazy. This would never work. Back in those days, everybody thought they knew that all bats were rabid and would attack people and certainly weren't anything you wanted to spend money saving. But now I'm about to show you why saving bats is critically important, regardless of how ignorant we may have been in the past. <clears throat> These are coming out of Bracken Cave in Texas. I personally spent 20 some years getting that site and several thousand acres around it protected. So I have a pretty good idea of what it's taking to protect your old growth sites. Uh, we ha had to be very patient, got 10 acres. I thought I was lucky as could be when I got 10 acres. Then, then we got 100, and then we got 2,000, and just kept working on it. But that cave is only 20 miles from the center of one of our largest cities, where you can imagine the real estate is not inconsequential. Now, why is it really important to protect these bats? This, there are 10 to 20 million bats in Bracken Cave, and they consume very conservatively, more than 100 tons of insects nightly. Stop and think how many it takes to make a single pound, and tons are just unimaginable. The impact ecologically and economically is incredible. Our Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has estimated that these bats are worth $1.4 billion each summer in protection of Texas agriculture for reducing pesticide needs. These bats are very vulnerable like many other bats. In Bracken Cave, they cover the walls at up to several hundred in a square foot. And all it takes is one misguided human, a couple worn out car tires and a bucket of gasoline or kerosene light it in the cave entrance. It's been done plenty of times in Mexico and burn millions of bats in a single event. Not hard to find them. You can see the columns coming out for miles around. Now let's look at what just one of these bats can accomplish. During the migration of corn ear and armyworm moths, billions of them migrate out of Mexico and Central America high above the landscape 
And these bats can actually go up and catch tailwinds and travel at up to 100 miles an hour. And they find those incoming migratory flocks and just one bat can catch enough of those moths in a single night to prevent them from laying 20,000 or more eggs, which could force a Texas farmer to spray multiple acres of corn or cotton at a cost of $75 an acre. Give you another view of what they're doing. On a summer night when the moths aren't migrating, but they're just coming off the crops, here you see these red blotches are bats coming out of three caves. The stippling over here is caused by huge numbers of corn earworm and armyworm moths coming off of crops. Just 12 minutes later, notice where the bats are having crossed four counties. Four counties in 12 minutes, and they're just engulfing the area of pests. It didn't take brilliant Einsteins to figure out what was going on. The meteorologists, as soon as they got set up, called me and said, oh, you're, you're going to love this, and had me down to take a look at what they were seeing. Now, here locally, you know, you don't have to have caves with huge numbers of bats to make a big difference. These are big brown bats. Last night when Aaron turned on the bat detector, immediately we heard one feeding overhead. These guys too have huge impact. You don't have to have millions coming out of one cave to make a lot of difference. These guys, you don't have any single big colonies, but you've got colonies scattered all over. And John Whitaker years ago in a study in Indiana estimated that a number of these big brown bats that could live in one backyard bat house could prevent the laying of 33 million cucumber beetle eggs in a single summer. That's enough if you've ever been a gardener. <laughs> you know you don't want to see 33 million cucumber eggs anywhere near you. Today in the United States, we use an estimated billion pounds of pesticides annually. This is a very serious threat. Just a few years ago, the Journal of Toxicology, and I can't read it down at the bottom, it's off the bottom, but anyway, the Journal of Toxicology published a review paper based on 480 studies of impacts of pesticides on people. And they found, you know, just a few problems here associated with causing cancer, diabetes, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, birth defects, reproductive disorders, almost anything we fear, we can enhance the probability of contracting because of careless use of pesticides. We started using pesticides about the time of World War II. Since then, we have more than double the quantities used, and we're having more, more losses than we did before we had pesticides. And the way we keep level now so that we don't keep losing more and more crops is that each year we use more pesticides or more deadly pesticides to achieve the same thing. This is what the entomologists refer to as a pesticide treadmill. We more effectively kill the predators than we do the prey when we use pesticides. I point out to people, every time you lose another insect eating bat, you've just taken one step closer to permanent addiction to pesticides. Not something I think any of us like the looks of. <clears throat> Here's what can be done with bats though. In the Mediterranean, scientists put up small bat houses strategically placed around rice crops. And over a period of years, they attracted enough bats that they were able to eliminate the need for pesticides. Now, they point out that this wouldn't have been possible 
without diverse habitat. And this is something that I think is a strong argument when you're acquiring the habitats that you folks are so passionately acquiring and protecting. Over here, that is national park property. And when the rice is harvested and there's no more rice pests to eat, the bats simply go over and feed on the diverse insect fauna that come from the mix found in the national park. And this is true worldwide. You can't, once you create a big enough monoculture or something, you've eliminated a lot of the kinds of animals that in nature could have helped you. But if you save a patchwork of habitat, you're far more likely to succeed in getting help from nature. Now, another thing that uh, <clears throat> I'd like to point out is that bats at night will travel out over bit much bigger areas, travel farther over monocultures than any other animal would during the day. Birds and, and other animals take a very big risk of being captured by hawks or other predators if they go too far out in a monoculture in the daytime. But with bats like free tail bats, for example, because they can travel so fast so far, what would be a monoculture and inhospitable to another kind of animal is a diverse habitat to a free tail bat because he can move around and cover a larger area. Looking at the United States as a whole, it's estimated that our bats save farmers right now uh, close to $23 billion a summer. And that's with populations dramatically reduced. Our bats are the most endangered mammals of America today. Just imagine what we could do if we had most of those bats back if we weren't dealing with small proportions of past numbers. And the only way we're ever going to get bigger numbers back is to do a combination of things. One involves saving key hibernation caves and the other involves saving key habitats like you're doing. Uh, many of you have been participating for some time as outstanding bat conservationists without knowing it. We teach workshops at Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation for growers to learn the value of bats in their orchards. We showed macadamia growers in South Africa the bats catching their worst past the green stink bug, and immediately they were so interested that they hired, they funded two PhD level programs to study how to get more bats in their orchards. And these people are last summer uh, at a workshop. In fact, uh, one of you here tonight uh, was at that workshop. Here we give people a chance to hands on see what's happening in their orchards at night. And even the guy that owned this orchard was incredulous that we could find eight species of bats active in his orchard, and he had never seen a single species in his orchard. Here I'm demonstrating the use of bat houses. These are bat houses that are described in detail in my new bat house guidebook. Fortunately, we found a farmer who not only is a leading pecan grower, but he has a major sawmill, and he now makes some really incredibly good bat houses. Again, they're described in our bat house guide, and of the first 18 of these that he's made and put in his orchards, he's had 100% occupancy within the first year. Here's the bat house guide. You can order it on Amazon if you can't find it in your local store. These bats, 105 of them, moved into this bat house within less than a week of the time it was put up. Now that's not something that I would <laughs> count on. Uh, 
Uh, but they were apparently especially desperate for a roost. What we more often find is if the bats have already been depleted in your area and there are not too many left, uh, you'll get a small number move in and then over a period of several years, it'll build up to larger numbers. But speaking of building up, the world record is at Gainesville, Florida, where I built a bat house, or I designed a bat house for the university that would, it was like, I think 16 feet square. And it took three years to get any decent numbers of bats in it. In the meantime, the media loved to poke fun at me, the expert who designed a $20,000 bat house that the bats didn't want. But uh, now that it's got a quarter million bats in it, there's a lineup of people who are swearing that they designed the bat house and come by our plans and we'll show you how to build it. <laughs> bats are not just important to us economically. This is a Snorn Desert in Arizona and between southwestern U.S. and northern Chile there are literally hundreds of species of agave and columnar cacti that rely on bats for pollination and many of them all for both pollination and seed dispersal. Bats, believe it or not, carry more pollen farther than any other pollinator. And many tropical, tropical and subtropical plants actually compete intensely for bat services. This is a Cardone cactus, the world's largest, gets over 50 feet tall, provides all kinds of great habitat for other animals. Here a Gila woodpecker is nesting in one and it's feeding its uh, chicks the uh, fruit of yet another bat dependent uh, cactus species. And in Mexico, this agave plant is the source of all the world's tequila, worth a billion dollars a year. You might not have your margaritas without bats. There are about 300 species of agave, and to the best of our knowledge, most of them are bat pollinated. Now, I am very fascinated with how plants avoid mixing pollen and still compete for bats. I found in this one place, in the same spread of dates, eight species of plants that were depending on bats for pollination. So what are the plants gonna to do to keep from mixing pollen, the bat carrying multiple species of pollen on one body and thus uh, causing hybridization? You know, like when you breed a horse and a donkey and you get a sterile mule. So this plant has a hand-like structure and puts it's pollen between the shoulders of a bat. This one puts it on his throat. This one puts it on his chin. This one puts it on his wings. And there's yet another place to put pollen on a bat to keep from mixing it up. Think about that for a minute. Well, unless you heard me speak before, you're probably not going to come up with the answer. This is a macuna flower, widespread species in Latin America. And this is what we call an inflorescence. It's a whole bunch of flowers on one stalk. This we call, this is a long stem that's called a peduncle. And it's three or four feet long. And it keeps possums or other animals from climbing down to get to the flowers to steal the nectar. These flowers don't become active for pollination until it's completely dark, about 45 minutes after sundown. Then, when one's ripe and ready to be visited, you see these haven't opened yet, but this one has turned its first petal up like a little flag that says, here, I'm ready, come to me. And this petal serves as a reflector. The bat transmits its echolocation sounds from its nose 
and he's aiming that nose leaf right into that reflector. So that's how he gets guided in, just like the pitcher plant guiding a bat into its roost. Now, why does a bat need to be guided so well? Because he has to put his tongue in a slot that's just two millimeters wide. That's not much bigger than a large pencil lead. So his tongue goes in there, and what happens next? He gets zapped. It fires Paul and literally on his rump. <laughs> now, I, one of my big goals in life is yet to provide all of my collection of 150,000 slides with keywording and proper computerization and captioning so that people like you, when you need to entertain the public with bats or <laughs> promote bat conservation, can simply order them just like you order out of a book catalog. And if you simply let us know that you're a conservationist, use them for conservation purposes, we often give them away free, and if not, at a very minimal price. But these pictures have laid literally the foundation of bat conservation for years, and it's absolutely critical. I'm 82 now. Before I pass on, we need to get these completely organized and computerized so that uh, people like you can use them. And we do have 2,000 already up for use that cover almost anything you could imagine. And feel free to check out my gallery and use our pictures if you can find them useful for your conservation purposes. Now, this is a picture my wife Paula took uh, of a cool plant. It's, I'm trying to remember the name of it, Puya. It lives in the Paramo of the Andes and it takes a hundred years to mature sufficiently to produce one of these flowering heads. A hundred years. You'd think that anything that spent a hundred years producing its first flowers and then died would have to be very selective about who pollinates it. These flowers live up in the Paramo that's too high and too cold for bats to live and rear their young up there. So how in the world do they get bat pollinated? Well, what happens, bats live down in the warm tropical and subtropical valleys and they ride thermals up to the high Andes in the evening just like we ride escalators in a shopping center. Bats that pollinate flowers are found throughout the world's tropical and subtropical areas, and they're incredibly important. This is a baobab tree, probably one of, if not the most famous tree in the world. Very important, both ecologically and economically. It's pollinated by bats. Until I first visited Africa, everybody thought it was pollinated by bush babies. But I pointed out that the bush babies climb down from above and stick their tongues in the nectaries here, steal the nectar. They don't have to ever get down here and touch the reproductive organs. Same for birds. They can land on top and they don't have to go down to the uh, reproductive organs. And the other thing is these flowers only open after sundown and they fall off by morning. But as you can see, with the reproductive organs hanging down below, a bat can't even land without completely encasing those stigma and, and other reproductive parts between its wings and, and furry body. These, the fruits from this tree sell for vitamins for a billion dollars a year in addition to the importance of the tree to wildlife. In Australia, many of the most important timber trees are bat pollinated or seed dispersed. This is an endangered spectacle flying fox pollinated black bean tree. In Southeast Asia, all of our progenitor bananas, all our wild bananas 
are bat pollinated. Without bats, we probably would have never had bananas, the most valuable single crop, I think, in the world. And if that's not impressive enough, bats also pollinate durian, which are worth multi-billions annually in Southeast Asia. And there's an interesting and sad story here. A single tree can produce hundreds, if not thousands, of these flowers in a night. They have to be pollinated by a bat, each one, to produce a fruit. And in order to sure, ensure that bats reach all the flowers, each time a flower is pollinated, it drops its petals and no longer needed anthers to the ground, like this. The farmer comes along, he sees all the bats up in his trees at night, he finds all this rain of flower parts, and concludes that the bats are destroying his chances of a good crop. So he goes out and sets nets to kill the bats. Should he fully succeed, he will have nuked his next crop. And everywhere I've gone, from Thailand to Philippines, I've explained to farmers what they're doing. In this case, these nets I was told extended for nearly a mile and were left up year round killing any bat that happened by. And they'd just be left up until they got so heavy with dead bats that they'd fall to the ground. In the neotropics, bats also have problems, as you have many times heard probably. They, everybody in Latin America, most people think that all bats are vampires. I had a very wealthy man from Monterey join my board one time, and his secretary put on his vitae that he was now a trustee of Vampire Conservation International. <laughs> but these forests are, bats are absolutely key to the health of these forests, both for pollination and seed dispersal. This bat, is carrying a piper fruit, it can disperse 60,000 seeds in a single night. Imagine the impact on reforestation. And now I want to share one of my favorite places, one that we're working right now, and those of you who are members already of my organization, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this kind of thing possible. These are straw-colored flying foxes, eight million of them. Each has a three-foot wingspan. The combined group can disperse more than a million tons of seeds in a night. They migrate across equatorial Africa, thousands of kilometers seasonally, and they have enormous impact in reseeding cleared areas as you may have heard, desertification is one of the greatest causes of famine in, in Africa. And yet these bats are the best hedge you'll ever find against desertification. They're the ones that replant clearings when they get abandoned as farmland. Unfortunately, people don't see and understand what these bats do. And recently there's been a lot of propaganda about them supposedly carrying terrible diseases and people are even less tolerant than usual. We just went out there and surveyed the area from a helicopter, shot film, not film anymore, but digital images, and uh, we're going to share our photos and our knowledge with the rest of the world to alert people to just how serious losing these bats is. They're declining at rather alarming rates, and Unfortunately, just because they're bats and out in the middle of nowhere, they're pretty much ignored by virtually everybody who should be paying attention. 70% of the fruits that you see that come from tropical areas are from plants that depend on bats for pollination or seed dispersal. I want to give you a quick illustration of just how important bats can be to one community. Forty-some years ago, 
these monks in Thailand wanted me to tell them why their bats were declining. They depended on guano sales for fertilizer for their uh, economic existence. Didn't take me long to find that poachers were killing countless thousands of bats. I recommended that the monks hire a game warden and it would cost a fraction as much for the game warden as they would make in increased guano sales if they hired one. Paul and I came back 10 years later and the bat population had grown so much you could see the columns going out for miles around. Thousands of people were coming to see the bats. The local people were doing all kinds of risk business selling to the tourists. A study published in a scientific journal uh, documented that these bats were conservatively saving local rice growers $300,000 a year and they're making enough money that for the first time they were able to subsidize the local school to the extent that the principal, the teachers, and all the students one day a week now wear bat t-shirts to school in honor of the bats and these children now get scholarships to go to college uh, based on proceeds from saving the bats. This is Norma Monfort's bat cave in the Philippines. She was ordered a few years ago to turn over her property. It was being condemned for agriculture by the Philippine government. She contacted every conservation organization she'd ever heard of trying to get help. Nobody even responded to her. When she contacted me, I was there within the month. We did a quick survey measuring the numbers of bats there. And then when I found that there were 2 million bats in her cave and that they'd all been killed out of the 90 to 100 percent had been lost out of other caves that weren't protected. And then I got community leaders together and I showed them that these bats pollinated durian, which is one of their favorite crops and pointed out that a colony of two million of these bats could pollinate tens of millions of durian in a single night and let them think about the repercussions of losing that many durians. And an hour later, not surprisingly, I'm seated beside the town mayor and leading citizens of the community sign a successful petition telling the government that this is critical wildlife habitat and it's got to be saved. <laughs> this is what bats still have to put up with despite all we're learning about their values. Time Magazine, bats are number one carriers of disease. NPR, Bats are arguably among the most dangerous animals in the world. Wall Street Journal. Where will the next pandemic come from? Likely from bats. Did you know that bats have the finest safety record of any animal I know of in, when it comes to not transmitting disease to humans? I have worked for more than 60 years with bats in 45 countries every continent where they exist. I've spent hours and hours in caves with millions of them. I'm still healthy. I'm 82 years old. I have not had any problem from bats. <laughs> if you simply don't go around picking up, you know, if you can find a bat out in the open in the daytime, it's probably a sick bat. It makes sense not to pick it up and get bit by it. And if you do pick it up and get bit by it, for God's sake, get the bat checked to make sure it wasn't rabid. For all you hear about the danger of rabies from bats, only one to two people a year in all the US and Canada combined can track rabies from a bat. And those people have almost always picked up a sick bat, been bitten, and then they didn't do anything about it. 
We have the perfect test case in Austin, Texas for whether bats are dangerous or not. When I first went there in the early 80s, Austin was generating the worst publicity in the world. From coast to coast in the U.S., you could read stories claiming that hundreds of thousands of rabid bats were invading and attacking the citizens of Austin. People were signing petitions to have the bats eradicated. I had just decided to start devoting full time to conserving bats, and it wasn't going to bode well for my activities if this continued. So I went to Austin, met with the people, convinced them of the reality of bats, pointed out that they're a potential gold mine, and today that bridge is wall to wall people from all over the world. Austin is world famous for its bats. We bring in millions of tourist dollars a summer, and the bats control tons of insect pests each night. They've been a fabulous investment. Not a single person has been attacked, contracted disease, or in any way harmed by one of our bats. Final story. When I started my career, the endangered gray bat was so precipitously declining that leading authorities predicted that it would soon become extinct. Cavers were a big part of the problem, cavers and cave owners. Uh, the cavers, every time you'd put a protective gate up to keep people from disturbing the bats, they would tear the gate down, took pride in their ability to do it quickly. Uh, owners had been told by the health department that their bats were rabid and would, if they didn't do something about them, they would kill their cattle or their children. In fact, one old man broke down in tears when I asked him why he burned his bats and he told me that he'd been told by somebody in the health department that they were rabid. And I just asked him, I said, how many generations have you lived here? He'd been there for three generations. And uh, I said, and how many of your cattle died of rabies? Did anybody in your family ever get attacked by a bat or die of any, get any kind of disease from a bat? Well, no, no. And you let some city slicker come out here and tell you that you need to kill all your bats because they're dangerous? And the poor guy was just horrified. But that's the situation I faced in those days. I was doing a PhD thesis on these bats, and people were burning whole caves full of bats. It was horrible. I started what I now talk about as my win friends, not battles approach. I'm sure you're using a lot of that similar approach in acquiring land. I let people see the advantages of doing the right thing without trying to force them to do, quit doing the wrong thing. And um, this bat is today as a result of completely positive approaches. We have, um, we have millions more of these bats than we had when they were predicted to go extinct. I just want to point out that this and these previous stories I've told you illustrate to me conclusively that it's not too late to make a very big difference. And I know that's what you believe here. And it's the same for your activities in Arch of the Appalachians. It's not too late to make a very big difference that will dramatically help future generations. And yet, if we don't make a big difference, we don't have a whole lot of time to wait. Once these animals are gone, once the forests are gone, it will be incredibly difficult to do anything to better the future. Bats urgently need our help and we urgently need theirs. I hope you've enjoyed learning about bats. On our website, 
you can see thousands of bat pictures. You can find resources that tell you how to save bat caves. You can find my recipe for winning friends instead of battles. Uh, hopefully, many of you will find opportunities to take advantage of those resources. We have them there strictly for people like you to use. And I'm very, very happy with what I can tell you from personal experience about winning friends instead of battles. Any questions? Yeah. How do you know if you have bats in a bat house? Well, I, I used to tell people look for droppings underneath, but we've now found several of our bat houses that we don't know yet which species of bats is doing it, but they're occupied and there are no droppings under them because apparently they go away to defecate so that they don't attract predators to the odor. Um, Normally, you can see droppings under the bat house, and certainly, if you watch in you know in the first 40 minutes or so after sundown, you can use a red light if you need to, and just don't put it real bright right into the entrance. But you can see the bats coming out. Yeah, back and back. There's an incredible competition out there for readership and scary stories by readership, big time. When, when a story came out by virologists that make big bucks scaring people about bats, the media grabbed it big time and ran with it with headline stories about how dangerous bats were. When a couple years later, a much more credible study was published in a scientific journal pointing out that bats had no more, carried no more viruses than any other group of animals. It was virtually ignored by the media. Uh, I can't explain all that except that it seems like if you follow the money, you figure out what's going to happen. And let me point out also that uh, those who scared us about straw-colored flying foxes being the source of Ebola when it broke out in 2013 or 14. Uh, our Congress allocated more than $3 billion to find the source of Ebola, and most of that was squandered trying to prove that it came from bats. Why try to prove it came from bats? Because bats are little known. It's easy to get people frightened of them. And the more you frighten people, the bigger the bucks you can generate in grants. And it's been that way ever since when I first started studying bats. Back then, everybody knew that most bats were rabid. You know, they'd all been told that. And yet we know now that there's only one or two people a year in all the U.S. and Canada combined that can track rabies from a bat. And those are people that pick up one that's sick. I addressed a rabies conference one time, and I had fun with this. When I started out, I said, I, I know many of you are very concerned about bats as a source of rabies. But I'm just curious, how many of you have a dog at home? <laughs> Most of them had dogs. And I pointed out that dogs killed more than twice as, well, not more than twice as many. It's, it's one to two for bats, and it's 40 to 45 a year for dogs in outright attacks. And then I quickly followed up and said, but you know, I'm not proposing that we rid our neighborhoods of dogs. That would be rather crazy and hypocritical in a society where our own spouses kill us off by more than a thousand a year. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have more human fatalities in North America from dog attacks annually than we have had blamed on bats in, in the history of record keeping for bat disease. So this stuff, they're just cherry picking information and presenting it in a way that's very convenient to scare us into spending money on things that we really shouldn't be wasting our money on. 
If you get COVID, it's not going to be from a bat. It's going to be from another human. I'm happy to have you answer that. Uh, I'll try not to get into one of my long tirades because this is something that makes me really especially upset. Uh, just two weeks ago, I saw notice of an $8 million grant given to a university to find a, an, a vet to develop a vaccine to protect bats from WNS. All you have to be is able to think logically. You don't have to know much about vaccine to know that that's a complete boondoggle, a complete waste of money. I can't even, it, it drives me crazy thinking what we could do with $8 million correctly spent for conservation, and yet we spend it on something like that that can't make any difference. Imagine trying to vaccinate all the millions of bats in America, and then how long before you'd have to give them a booster shot? <laughs> and, you know, it's just ridiculous, and we should know that, but it's a lot easier to scare people in, you know, we know that vaccines work in peoples, and uh, so why not in bats? But it's a whole different story when you start doing it for bats, and I really deplore the money we're spending that way. What we know from a lot of research, and I have a paper published for peer-reviewed publication right now, I just submitted it last week, showing that we have abundant evidence now that the fungus that causes white-nose syndrome grows too slowly at low temperatures to cause the bats a serious problem. And at low enough temperatures, the bats metabolize so much slower that they don't run out of energy because the fungus wakes them up extra time. So, if you just give bats back, and we know that most of our Eastern North American bats that were the most abundant in America, they used to hibernate at between two and six degrees Celsius. We have chased them out of almost all of those caves that provide stable temperatures in that range. And so now they burn much more energy to get through the same length of winter. And the fungus can grow much more rapidly because they're in warmer roosts. And the combo is deadly. But if you go to Eurasia, there's a paper published showing that over the whole area of Eurasia, they looked at hibernation sites of bats. They found the fungus that's killing our, causing the death of our bats. They found it widespread and not killing anybody because the bats were hibernating at three degrees Celsius. So, you know, excuse me, but I'm a bit perturbed when I see huge amounts of money being allocated to find a cure for white nose syndrome when all we need to do is provide the bats with the habitat they need. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, my hearing isn't that well, and I'm having a hard time hearing you from back there. Can somebody closer up repeat to me what the question? It's very hard to explain human responses. In Kenya, I have field notes about two tribes that live next to each other. And one tribe, like the Chinese, eulogizes bats as symbols of good luck. They think if a bat shows up in your hut, you should treat him very, very nice and not scare him away because your cattle will prosper if you have bats. And then there's a tribe next door that thinks that if a bat shows up in your hut, that it's an omen of terrible things, death in the family, you need to get him out of there quick. Uh, I love Halloween time. It's a good time to educate people about bats. Uh, so Halloween stories aren't a problem. It's, it's just, it's the medical claims that are the most damaging. Uh, 
and they are clearly refutable. I hope I answered your question. Yes. First of all, keep doing what you're doing, saving old growth forests, because one of the biggest reasons why bats don't have places to live today is that we've lost old growth forests. I don't have to tell you guys that we don't have probably, what well, we don't have 5% of old growth forests left in America. And these ancient trees had all kinds of hollows and cavities in them that provided ideal bat roosts. They provided ideally diverse prey for bat to eat. Uh, as we've lost these forests, and I've had people tell me that it can't be forest loss that's harming bats because we have more forest cover now than we did in the 1800s. True, but what kind of forest cover? Saplings growing up unthin, too close together, no roosts in them, no f adequate food coming from them. Uh, that's not the same as having old growth forest. And white nose syndrome gets back to not only not having these forests that were so good for bat living quarters and food in the summer, but we've also, Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, for example, had, well, it, it has 450 miles of passages many of them huge, I mean as big as this auditorium, and multiple entrances at different levels, so you get chimney effect airflow and you get warm air traps and cold air traps, and they can be very stable, and there's nothing that could be better for these bats to survive climate change than having caves like that, but we kicked them out. It is provable that Mammoth Cave had more than 10 million bats probably many more than 10 million bats when Europeans first arrived. I have personally gone to the Smithsonian and examined voucher specimens from the mid-1800s of endangered Indiana and gray bats from Mammoth Cave. We have the word of a Princeton professor who was asked to come and look and see if there are really millions of bats there. And in his report, he said, well, I just went in a short distance. I didn't need to go very far to vet to confirm that there are millions of bats, there are at least millions in Mammoth Cave. We had, there's another cave in, in Indiana, uh, Wyandotte Cave, that had a large number. And one of my big frustrations over time has been how difficult it has been to get federal and state agencies to do what needs to be done for bats at some of these sites. At Mammoth Cave National Park, we found that one of the caves that is part of that system but not known to be connected to Mammoth Cave and they don't use it for tours, I found evidence of bat staining on the limestone where there had been millions of bats. And it took us five years to convince park officials to allow us at no cost to the park to remove a concrete barrier that was blocking airflow and making it uninhabitable for hibernating bats. I went off after that and forgot about it once we succeeded. Just a couple of years ago, 25 years after the event, a friend of mine showed me a film of a large number of bats coming out of a cave and I said, oh, that looks like Long Cave that we altered, restored in Mammoth Cave National Park. He said, yeah, that's where it was. There are now a half million bats in that cave, and we, all we had to do was remove a barrier that was blocking airflow. And at Wyandotte Cave in Indiana, we did extensive research there, and if you go to my resource on my website, the one called Finding and Restoring America's Historic Bat Caves, you'll find detailed drawings and explanations and photos showing exactly how you can find these places and exactly what needs to be done to restore them. I believe that there, with volunteer assistance, we could probably keep it under $20,000, maybe under $10,000 to fix that in a manner that we could probably restore hundreds of thousands of endangered Indiana bats. 
at Uniman's abandoned silica mine in Illinois, they called me and asked if, if we'd be interested in turning it into a bat sanctuary when they finished using it. I sent staff up to check it, and we found that it had ideal conditions for endangered Indiana bats. Based on that knowledge, without any bats present, we raised a quarter million dollars. I mean, that shows how confident I was, and I'm gonna be pretty embarrassed if I raise a quarter million dollars for a boondoggle. <laughs> and so we, we gated it, shored it up so it would be secure for the future, and 10 years later, we had the largest remaining Indiana bat population in that cave. There isn't anything we, I mean, it's just not true that we can't do something about these things, but there are just so few people who really understand and care that government officials, you know, just don't feel obligated to do anything sometimes. And uh, it's very important that bats have a constituency, and that's what I'm about. Uh, my new organization, we reached people in 70 countries in the last two weeks. And before that, we were on the Joe Rogan show, which he reaches more people than all the networks combined, and I had a couple hours on his show. Uh, we are getting out there, and uh, I really, really appreciate those of you who are members of my organization making these things possible. I couldn't do them alone. If you like what we're doing, join us. I would love to cooperate more with what you guys are doing as well. I, I see a very strong partnership potential in helping save old summer habitats as well as abandoned winter habitats.